Good day, and welcome to our second podcast in the Policy Insight Forum series on a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service. I'm your moderator. My name is Jeff St. John. I'm the director of the National Security Studies Program of the Policy Insights Forum, a unit of the Samuel Group of Companies. We're privileged to be joined today by Professor Wesley Wark, the doyen of Canadian intelligence historians, who will address the question of why Canada does not already have a foreign intelligence service similar to, for example, the British MI6. Professor Wark is an expert on Canadian national security and intelligence issues. He is a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation and co-author of that center's special report, Reimagining a Canadian National Security Strategy, which can be accessed at CIGI's website. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and an MA from Cambridge University. Professor Wark served as a member of the Prime Minister's Advisory Council on National Security for two terms, from 2005 to 2009, and was an advisor to the Minister of Public Safety on national security policy and legislation between 2015 and 2019. Professor Wark has taught at the University of Toronto, the London School of Economics, McGill University, and the University of Calgary. He is currently teaching courses on intelligence and security at the Basile Executive Institute. He is a frequent contemporary contributor to the Canadian media on national security issues, and he writes an excellent newsletter on national security and intelligence issues available at wesleywork.substack.com. Professor Wark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for that very generous um, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, we're talking about a subject that uh, I really love to talk about. Professor, all of Canada's close allies have a foreign intelligence service. The United States has, of course, the CIA. Britain has MI6, more properly known as the Secret Intelligence Service. France, Australia, and Germany, to take three examples, all have foreign intelligence services. Yet Canada does not. What, in your view, were the principal reasons in the past for Canada not creating a foreign intelligence service? Jeff, let me begin by saying that uh, the debate over creating a foreign intelligence service is one of the most longstanding and persistent issues that keeps popping up, uh, keeps popping its head up. Um, it's certainly at least in in the inner circles of the intelligence community uh, over many years. In fact, the earliest proposals for creating a Canadian foreign intelligence service date back to the end of the Second World War. And we continue to give this subject over all of these decades uh, occasional thought. But the essence of your question is why, despite all that thinking, uh, and despite some interesting proposals along the way, why did Canada never decide to create a foreign intelligence service? And I think, you know, looking looking back over this long period of debate, I think there are three reasons that stand out, and and I've heard these reasons more um, in in a more contemporary frame as well. It's not just historical arguments. One is uh, the question of resources, and and it's often suggested by people who are uh, opposed to the idea of creating a foreign intelligence service that it would simply be too costly. There are two problems with that argument. One is that I have never seen uh, any cost estimates put alongside um, the question of creating a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service. If we were really serious about putting together a cost estimate, we could simply go to the Australian model, which has a, a small but probably would be you know, comparable size uh, outfit to something that Canada would put together. And we could, we could easily find out what its annual budget and costs were and, and add a few bits and bobs to that and come up with a figure. But, you know, the, the cost uh, question is always a shibboleth that's never been uh, really researched. Second issue that's raised uh, is a little more serious, I think, and deserves a little more serious attention. And that is that, well, Canada could create a foreign intelligence service. That is a, a service that would rely, as as our you know counterparts in the Five Eyes do, on, on the use of human agents around the world. Canada could you create such a service, but where would it operate exactly? What would be the Canadian role or the Canadian niche? 
in what sense would it make to create a Canadian service that might operate alongside MI6 or the Australians or the CIA? Would it not be simply duplicative or get in the way of the more established intelligence services? So, so that question of you know wh where in the world would a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service go has has been raised repeatedly. And alongside that is is the question of well maybe we could figure that out maybe we could figure out a kind of geographic scope for it a particular area of interest that would be useful to Canada and our partners but alongside that is often the argument that well you know in the in the scope of all the different kinds of intelligence sources available to Canada what would be the real value added of having that perhaps fairly small pipeline of information that you would get from a human, to say, often called human intelligence service. So those two things operate in common as an argument. I think there are, you know, ways to rebut that argument in terms of saying simply that a Canadian foreign intelligence service would be targeted uh, at areas uh, established by the government as intelligence priorities where Canada would have access and could operate and could operate to the benefit not only of ourselves, but also of our Five Eyes partners. In other words, if you set up a service, you'll certainly want to do it alongside our allies and you would want to figure out, um, you know, where Canada could be, uh, could provide the most value. And, and I think the, the most practical kind of answer to this question of, you know, where would a foreign intelligence service operate? Is, is partly in reflection of intelligence priorities the government would set, what are the top ones, uh, how could a foreign intelligence service help with those. But whenever Canada gets involved in a major international crisis, including uh, you know, committing troops to the resolution of that crisis, we have repeatedly found uh, that we're short of intelligence and that a, having a foreign intelligence service in the field would be helpful um but we've never you know we, we've always uh had to rely on our allies and the the two cases that come to mind and we can talk about these later if you'd like uh where where this experience was i think sharply felt one was in the immediate aftermath of the 9 11 attacks and the beginning of an american kind of global pursuit of terrorism the so-called global war on terrorism where it was felt that uh that Canada was kind of blind to the global issues that terrorism was presenting and could use a foreign intelligence service. Uh, and it was debated at the time, but not acted on. And again, once we got heavily involved in Afghanistan in a combat mission, particularly in Kandahar after 2006, we felt the feeling, you know, I think what we discovered was that uh, as much as it was good to have allies alongside us operating in that theater, it, it would have been extremely helpful if we had a foreign intelligence service capacity to assist our combat operations and the other elements of the so-called 3DD program, um, you know, development and diplomacy as well. So, so you can you can easily point to some case studies where you could say, well, a foreign intelligence service would follow Canadian intelligence priorities and in a sense would follow the flag and provide some, some useful uh, intelligence to assist Canadian missions. So anyway, that's that's number two. You know, what exactly would it do? Where would it go? What's its niche? What would its niche look like? And then the third argument, and, and it and it reminds me of the first. The first again going back is just the you know too costly argument that's never really been probed properly. The third argument has been probed even less, but it's an interesting argument. It's very Canadian, and the argument is well, if a government you know, got ambitious and brave and decided to create a foreign intelligence service, it would have to announce that, it would have to legislate it, and how would the public react to it? And, and the view among bureaucrats that I've either read or heard directly is, well, the Canadian public would be deeply opposed to such a thing. I mean, this, this seems to me a, a piece of conventional wisdom that has never been, um, you know, never been explored, never been probed. I don't think there's any evidence for it. I don't think it's true <laughs> at all. I don't think Canadians would, you know, be aghast at the notion that that Canada uh, had decided to kind of step up its international game and and um, uh, try and, you know, deploy spies to our own national interest, service of our national interest, and and to aid our allies. So, of the three arguments, um, I would strike two off as, as empty, budget and um, lack of public support. 
the middle argument about you know having to define the mission i think is more serious but i think there are lots of answers to it you've answered one of my questions which was going to be which arguments you find are are valid arguments you've said that the second one the role the niche the value added of a canadian foreign intelligence service would have to be considered as part of the national debate and the uh, the government debate did any Canadian government in the past, to your knowledge, actively explore the idea, or was the issue never really weighed by government? Um, well, I can certainly point to some examples where the issue was seriously considered. And when I say seriously considered, I mean within a, a relatively small group of senior officials, sometimes involving politicians, sometimes not. So, so let me give you some examples that, that I'm aware of either from the documentary record or because I took part in them. Um, that you know, it also has to be said, we, we don't have the full documentary record. There may, may be other stories yes. um, in the archives that remain you know, highly classified and locked away somewhere. Um, but let, let me tell you this, the stories that I do know about, which I think are actually quite fascinating. A couple of them go back to the uh, immediate post-war period. That's post-Second World War. Um, and there was a lot of debate in Canada at the time. It's really quite fascinating period in terms of uh, officials turning their minds at the end of the war to well, what what can Canada need to do in a peacetime world where it wants to play a major diplomatic role and and perhaps even a major military role, things like um, support for the United Nations, joining NATO, and so on. What would Canada need in terms of a peacetime intelligence capability? This this was a real argument. And one strand of that argument was, should Canada create a foreign intelligence service? So there were proposals that were put forward. One of the most interesting was a proposal put forward by Sir William Stevenson, who um, you know some of your listeners may know as the so-called man called Intrepid, who had run a British intelligence station during the Second World War out of New York, and was you know considered a prominent figure in the world of Allied intelligence. Well, Sir William Stevenson put a proposal together for Canadian officials at the end of the war saying Canada really needs its own ind independent intelligence service, and I'm the man to run it. <laughs> so it was a, a bit of a personal project. Uh, it wasn't really fleshed out. He was, he was really just riding on his rep reputation, and I think a desire, honestly, to, I, I think Sir William Stevenson was in love with the world of intelligence, a desire to continue on in the peacetime world. Uh, but this proposal, although it was circulated, was really flatly rejected by by senior officials who, who were worried that it would be, you know, a kind of one man show that would be out of control and and really wouldn't achieve the kinds of objectives that Canada needed. So so that proposal was struck off the books. Um, but officials in the government, some officials in the government persisted with the idea. And, and one of the most um, I think one of the strongest proposals that I've ever seen put together that, that survives in the documents was a proposal from a senior, what was then called Department of External Affairs, what we now know as Global Affairs Canada, senior official in the Department of uh, um, External Affairs called George Glazebrook, who'd, who'd had a lot to do with Canadian intelligence matters during the war and after the war. And Glazebrook uh, put together a, a, a proposal for senior officials in his own department uh, in 1951. And it was a proposal to create a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service who would operate alongside the British and Americans. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a substantial essay. And uh, his argument that was that this is something Canada simply needed to do for its own sake and to assist allies and maintain our ally worthiness. And when he touched on that question that I'd raised before of, well, you know, where would it operate? Glazebrook's idea was that, well, one key area where Canada could operate to the to its own benefit and in terms of assistance to its allies would be Central and Latin America, which was a region he knew that was um, relatively thinly covered by uh, British intelligence and at the time, certainly by by the CIA. So so he was looking for that that niche, that niche area, that niche capability came up with Latin America. And um, it's possible to follow the paper trail of this proposal. It went up to the undersecretary, as they were then called, or deputy minister, yes. um, 
of the day, a man named Arnold he Heaney. And there is a notation from Heaney, which I, with it, I think sort of sums up the bureaucratic sense of caution around these proposals um, that not only existed in 1951, but continued to exist. And, and that notation from Heaney reads uh, about Glazebrook's proposal, interesting, and I'm quoting directly from the document, interesting and able, but later on, I think. You know, the, the <laughs> ultimate bureaucratic stamp of no action, thank you. Um, you know, the, the uh, polar opposite to the famous Winston Churchill um, uh, annotations on documents, action this day. So nobody was going to take action this day on, on, on that one. Um, so then from there, we would have to fast forward. And again, I, I say there may be other proposals that, that remain uh, hidden away in the archives, but we really can fast forward to the post 9-11 period where, you know, Canadian intelligence community was uh, was being shaken up by the change in the international threat environment and new resources were coming to it. And uh, in, in the um, immediate year or two after the 9-11 attacks, 2001-2002, uh, senior officials in the intelligence community um, and the governing Liberal Party uh, did turn their attention seriously to this question. Should we create a foreign intelligence service, given that uh, we're in this new uh, and threatening, it seemed, uh, security environment where uh, global terrorism was, was a major security concern? Uh, and I can remember um, being brought into talks by uh, into a conversation by the National Security Advisor of the day to explore this question. What did I think? What would my my arguments be? A little more interestingly, perhaps, was that the Liberal Party caucus actually met in camera, I guess we could say, uh, to raise this question. Uh, and again, I was asked, and I think it's 2002, I was asked to... to um, to join them and uh, you know make some arguments about why this might be a useful idea to pursue. Nothing came of it uh, at the time, of course. And then, uh, you know, as I said before, I think the other moment in in recent history where uh, thinking again was advanced on this question of a foreign intelligence service was uh, as a result of the Canada's military involvement in in Afghanistan, especially once we got involved in some pretty hard fighting in Kandahar. Uh, and the experience of, of military commanders on the ground, Kandahar, was that we didn't have the intelligence support we needed. We were getting some from our allies, but not enough. Uh, and, and we could really have used uh, a foreign intelligence capacity. So that military situation, and you know, no one knew at the time how long that military uh, deployment would last. Uh, certainly, the situation in Afghanistan and the you know major Canadian military contribution there and, and loss of lives uh, led again to this question popping its head above the above the surface. Now, the result of of that was interesting because essentially. Um, the way in which this question was resolved then, and it was it was also not just Afghanistan, but it was also resolved in this direction um, uh, post 9-11, was the idea that the Canadian Security Intelligence Service uh, should be allowed to expand its global operations to some degree to try and cover that need. Uh, but at the same time, avoid the kind of upheavals that might be caused by trying to create an independent, standalone foreign intelligence service. So there were additional CSIS liaison officer um, uh, missions established abroad, a, a little a, a little more emphasis on intelligence gathering, not just liaison from some of those stations. So, so we kind of thrust CSIS uh into that job without changing its mandate or really providing it with the training or resources that, that it would require to do the job and ceases remains hampered to a degree by some of the peculiarities of, of its founding legislation in 1984 and when i say peculiarities this will be familiar to you jeff but perhaps not to all readers 
when the CSIS Act was promulgated in 1984, it established uh, two categories of intelligence missions that CSIS could pursue. And this is this has never changed down to the present. And those categories were that CSIS co could collect security intelligence uh, anywhere in the world. But the assumption in 1984 was that would predominantly be within Canada. But the act also says something that probably would strike listeners who are unfamiliar with this as kind of bizarre. The act also said, well, CSIS can collect foreign intelligence, but only in Canada. <laughs> so yes. uh, people are wondering about what that means. What that means essentially is that that um, the, the parliament, when it legislated the CSIS Act back in 1984, wanted to make sure that CSIS would have an ability to collect intelligence on foreign embassies and consulates in Canada. Yes. That was the foreign intelligence mission they were talking about. So CSIS has had to play around with that mandate whenever demands have come its way uh, to be more of a foreign intelligence service uh, operating outside, outside Canada. But I don't think anyone would argue, uh, either inside or outside CSIS, that it's really a foreign intelligence service. It remains a domestic security service focused on domestic security intelligence issues. You've raised a number of particularly interesting issues. And what I'm going to ask you now, if I could, is what are the compelling reasons for having a foreign intelligence service? And equally, what are the compelling reasons for not having one? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm chuckling here, Jeff, because I, to be honest, I don't think there are compelling reasons for not having one. So, so my answer is going to be a bit loaded in, in one direction. I think there are compelling reasons to have one. Um, and, and to say, of course, there are compelling reasons to have one is not to say that one is going to be created because, you know, despite the compelling reasons, um, I remain skeptical that any action in that direction is likely to be forthcoming. Um, you know, but let me say in my lifetime. So the compelling reasons, you know, I think where I would start is that um, Canada needs what I would call sovereign intelligence. It needs an ability to be able to generate intelligence uh, through collection and assess intelligence based on uh, its own tasking and its own collection capabilities uh, so that it can ask questions of the intelligence community that are relevant to Canadian interests and get answers. And, and this is, of course, distinct from an important ability to be able to draw on uh, the intelligence made available to us from our Five Eyes partners. And, and everyone will say, of course, that Canada is a is a net importer of intelligence and that we're dependent on our Five Eyes allies and all of that is true. Um, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that creating a Canadian foreign intelligence service in the interests of a, a greater sovereign capacity is really going to change that equation. We're never going to be able to equal the capacity of MI6 or certainly not the CIA. Uh, our, our ambitions in that regard, I think, would be more modest and limited than something, again, along the lines of, of the role played by the Australian Security Intelligence Service. But, but I think there's a compelling argument uh, about the need for a, a greater sovereign capacity where we have more control over um, intelligence collection and assessment. That would be the first argument. The second argument is that when Canada began to build a post-war intelligence system after 1945, it essentially put all its eggs in one basket. And the, the decision that was arrived at was that, well, Canada is going to develop a collection capability in the world of signals intelligence. And that's going to be an important contribution both in the Canadian interest, but also for our allies. And it will be our main um, contribution to what became the Five Eyes intelligence system. So, so we really focused for, for you know, um, in, in the construction of the Canadian system when it came to intelligence collection on global issues, we really focused on that signals intelligence capacity. And we created the what was initially called the Communications Branch of the National Research Council, 
which ultimately became the communication security establishment uh, as it exists today. And uh, that signals intelligence capacity from much of the Cold War period was focused on uh, intelligence collection, targeting the Soviet North in terms of its military and industrial and nuclear capacities in, in that region. And by all accounts, we don't have the full record of this, but by all accounts, it, it played an important role and was uh, and had some some good technological skills that it could bring to that story. But but uh, and this is a bit of a roundabout answer to your question. We've always thought of signals intelligence as our main form of uh, foreign intelligence collection. I think the argument to support a human service in the 21st century would be to say that you cannot do signals intelligence any longer as a standalone effort. You really need to combine a capacity of signals intelligence with a human organization with uh, an ability to collect diplomatic intelligence and an ability to collect open source intelligence. So it becomes part of a, a an all source package. And so if you think about Canada's sovereign intelligence needs, you also have to think about its all source intelligence needs. You cannot just rely on one stream of intelligence uh, collection. You need uh, multiple streams. And the Foreign Intelligence Service idea would be one of those streams. And it would help support. They would be mutually you know, supportive, uh, each helping to enhance and corroborate the other, whether it's open source, diplomatic reporting, foreign intelligence, human stuff, signals intelligence. It would all, um, you know, intertwine in, in important ways. That old-fashioned notion that Canada can decide we're just going to do one kind of intelligence collection and leave it at that, I just don't think is realistic in a 21st century world. And neither would I say, and this is an argument that has been raised more recently. You know, people will say, well, why would you need, you know, why would you need spies skulking around in the dark when you have, you know, this vast plethora of open source information? Um, and it's certainly true that you want to have a capacity to um, uh, to be able to collect and use open source intelligence. But again, it's it's not going to be a standalone, and it's not going to give you all the you know all the information that you're going to need. And it may give you important sort of indicators of what matters that you can go and chase through other means. But it's not going to you know be a standalone. And I you know I would also say in this capacity, it's a little bit off topic, but you know another decision that was made along the way as this Canadian intelligence system was built was that we were going to focus on signals intelligence. We wouldn't do um, we wouldn't do a foreign intelligence service or human. We also decided well we're not going to do imagery intelligence. Uh, and there's an interesting story there about <laughs> Canada being offered a capacity to fly U2 spy planes and all this kind of stuff, which which remained kind of hidden in the archives. We just we just thought, well, well, we'll get our imagery intelligence from our allies. Well, the world of imagery intelligence, as you'll know, has changed so dramatically uh, since those Cold War days and since those decisions that we didn't really need a Canadian capacity in imagery intelligence. That we that we've arrived in a 21st century world where there is a lot of there are a lot of space platforms that Canada could take advantage of, but we don't really have an integrated approach to that to get the most out of imagery intelligence from near Earth orbit, low Earth orbit uh, satellite systems, whether the commercial ones or whether uh, they might be ones that are kind of national assets. We don't really have, we have some sort of quasi-national uh, satellite assets, but but not many. Um, and, and radar sat has, has been around for a while, and and you know uh, thanks to the good engineers at MDA, it keeps it keeps flying and doing its stuff. And there's a radar sat too, and there's a you know a triple mission now that is more focused on polar issues. Um, but uh, as they say, it's it's partly a commercial platform, partially partially a national asset. Um, you know, if you ask the simple and straightforward question, does Canada have any spy satellites? The answer, the honest answer, would have to be no. I mean, we have some capacity to connect to things, but but that's it. So, I guess what I'm saying is that a foreign intelligence service becomes compelling in the context of wanting to have much more of an all source intelligence system that can feed into a sovereign capacity. Then the third the third answer I would excuse me make is that Canada continues to play an important role in the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. And, and, and 
we played an important role in really creating that alliance. Uh, in the beginnings, it was really just a, a US-UK um, signals intelligence sharing agreement until Canada came along and said, we want to join the club and began that expansion into the Five Eyes. And, and that actually goes back to 1949. Uh, so, so we were the third member of the Five Eyes, what became the Five Eyes, and, and an important uh, element in expanding it into the, uh, into the Pacific area with Australia and New Zealand. The, the challenge for Canada is, is maintaining our contribution to the Five Eyes and maintaining uh, the the supreme significance, as I think many people would regard it, of the Five Eyes and Intelligence Alliance. And, uh, you know, from, from time to time, there have been direct demands made on Canada from Five Eyes partners to, okay, Canada, step up. It's time to create a foreign intelligence service because we need that contribution from you for your Five Eyes membership. Other times, a little bit more subtle pressure than that direct pressure. Uh, but certainly the sense is that one of the ways in which Canada could secure its place in the Five Eyes Alliance, which is so valuable to us, would be to take that step and create a foreign intelligence service. So I think those are my three compelling reasons. Uh, the philosophy of a sovereign intelligence need, the importance of an all-source intelligence system, and the importance of maintaining, uh, solidifying our role in the Five Eyes. If I could add one possible addition to your list, that would be access to allied human intelligence, which you've already noted that Canada benefits disproportionately in our favor. It would seem to me that we would probably be able to get access to American, or not necessarily all of it, but at least some American, some British, some Australian human intelligence we perhaps do not now get. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I, I would put a slightly different spin on it, Jeff, and say that um, all, uh, all of our close allies that run sensitive foreign intelligence operations, human to operations, hold them pretty close. Um, and they do so for, for all kinds of reasons, not least for reasons of security. Uh, Historically, the British have been pretty generous and open at sharing the product of MI6 collection uh, with Canada without a quid pro quo, or at least not one that's you know visible <laughs> to us. But but the, but there's been a what I would call a, a generosity there. So so we've had access to some of that material. The CIA, I think, much more restrictive in terms of access. The Australians uh, prepared to give access where Canada can contribute in turn on issues that matters to them, which, which is primarily in the Pacific uh, theater and, and probably doesn't amount to a whole lot of made in Canada intelligence. So uh, the way I would put your, your point, which I think is a good one, is that um, a Canadian foreign intelligence service and a contribution it would make to the Five Eyes uh, would, I'm sure, provide more of a flow of a human from some of our organizations, uh, our allied organizations, uh, on top of uh, the various streams that come to us anyway. To go back to one of the first things that you talked about, the public reaction, do you think that there's a danger that the Canadian public might say, it would be wonderful to have a whole bunch of Canadian 007s operating out there in the world. Yes, I mean, with, with any initiative in the world of intelligence and national security, you, you know, you have to you have to contest with and take on board uh, popular culture, mythologies, and stereotypes, and and you know James Bond and 007 and. Um, uh, you know all the others, the Tom Clancy films and all the rest of it would 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 be in the public public consciousness. So you know you, you would have to have what governments like to call a communication strategy, which you know uh, for simpler folk like you and I simply means the government would have to be able to explain itself. What why do we need this? What is it exactly? What are the legal controls around it? Why is it important for Canada? You would certainly have to have that debate. Would Canadians get carried away by the popular mythology? I'm I'm. 
I don't think so, to be honest. And I, I really, you know, because we've never tried it, there's no real reference point. But I've, I've always been struck by the fact that, you know, whenever I teach courses on this to university students, um, a couple of things happen. One is that most university students kind of assume we have a foreign intelligence service. <laughs> they don't know I think, well, we don't have one. That's, that seems weird. Um, and also, it's 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 funny. I, it's not something I've uh, always encouraged, but in a way, whenever the opportunity comes up for a for a student to to write a kind of intelligence related paper, perhaps on a Canadian theme. You know, one of the most popular topics is, does Canada need a foreign intelligence service? This is just, you know, something that that obviously strikes the imagination. So, you know, I think I think in the answer to your question, I think we could have a mature debate about it in, in Canada. There will be voices for and voices against. But I, I don't think it would be submerged in popular culture and mythology. One final question that I want to put to you that you touched on was the CSIS role mm. or lack thereof in foreign intelligence. It strikes me that we would need to have a debate about whether or not a foreign intelligence service, a Canadian foreign intelligence service, would be part of CSIS or would be a standalone service. Do you have any views on that? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question, um, and I, I think there are two possible responses to it. One on on practical terms, it would probably be important to, you know, if, if we're thinking about uh, starting up such an organization, you'd have to have a reasonable sort of time frame in mind. You couldn't stand it up in a day or a month or a year, and it would be best stood up within an existing organization. So, so I would argue that create the nucleus of a foreign intelligence service within CSIS and and let it slowly devolve from there uh, over over a set period of time as you know training regimes and connections with allies are built up and and uh, when proprietors are set and so on and so forth so so build it inside CSIS and then let it ultimately separate from CSIS with maturity I think would be the the practical way to go about I don't think that would be terribly pleasing to the CSIS leadership, but but I think that's the practical um, way to go. And I, you know, I think the the lesson of our close allies in terms of you know whether you run a domestic security intelligence service and a foreign intelligence service in the same shop or not, the lesson among our Five Eyes partners is pretty clear. And the the lesson is no, you do not. In the U.S., you have the FBI for domestic security, along with a host of other organizations. And for foreign intelligence, you have the CIA and on the signals intelligence side, the National Security Agency. U.K., same picture. You have MI6 for foreign intelligence, MI5 for domestic security intelligence, with some interesting wrinkles around you know, colonial legacies and so on. And you have GCHQ for, for signals intelligence. Uh, Australia, same story. Um, uh, you have um, Australian Security Intelligence Organization, domestically like CSIS. You have uh, ACES, the Australian uh, Secret Intelligence Service for Foreign Intelligence. And you have the Australian uh, Signals Intelligence. So unless somebody comes up with a better argument that says all our Five Eyes partners are wrong in dividing these roles and maintaining them separately, um, uh, I think the, you know the the allied model in the Five Eyes system is the one to follow, and the real reason for that is that the the legal underpinnings, the training, the culture, the resources that you need for a foreign intelligence service are very different from a domestic security intelligence service. It's one thing to collect intelligence on uh, on home turf. And it's a very different thing to collect it abroad, often in you know so-called denied areas or in difficult areas to operate. Very much so. I would add one other uh, possible reason to that to that argument, which would be that CSIS is, or at least should be, a law-abiding agency, and a foreign intelligence service, by definition is a law-breaking agency in that it breaks the anti-espionage laws of other countries. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there, there is a different, there has to be a different, if you like, legal culture to those organizations. But it's also important to say that there will be legal rules of the road for both. The, of course. Just be different. 
Um, and there will you know, be different forms of ministerial accountability and internal accountability and external review and all of that. Uh, but they'll still be present for both. So, yes, um, absolutely. It's just foreign intelligence is different from domestic security intelligence. Professor, I want to thank you very much for sharing your views today. May I wish you all the best in your current and future endeavors. Thank you, Jeff. I hope we've moved the goalposts on this um, forward somehow or other. But thank you. Thank you again.